<clears throat> and welcome to the Mime Cast. Chance for people to, that are Mime Troop fans to get to know some Mime Troop folks a little bit better. And today we have the renowned playwright Robert Alexander with us. How you doing, Robert? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Oh, well as I can be locked in this house. Still some little more time. <laughs> It's still so weird to not be able to get out and see. Now, you just started going back to in-person teaching, you said? Monday. We started Monday. What was that so like? We, um, Monday through Thursday, I had to go in. And then the day we did it online. So mm. uh, that's the way it's going to go until the end of May. So <sighs> yeah. our, our Wednesday day is short. The shortest day of the week is Wednesday. We only have to go in for three hours. But we're going in for five hours uh, the other days. And then on um, Friday is a soft day. We have a two one-hour Zoom classes. Mm. And, uh, you know, working with kids with special needs. So, mm -hmm. But they're, they're great kids. They're great kids. I get a lot out of it. And, uh, you know, it's very rewarding work. Cool. What school do you teach at? I'm teaching at Oakland High. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, Valina's teaching high school and and over at uh, Gateway, Valina Brown, and um, okay. and so uh, yeah, and they have a lot of also you know special needs kids that they have to put extra, you know, time and attention and kids that, uh, with the whole pandemic, them having to stay home, does the amount of pressure on their parents, you know, that are used to having more support and how do they work their jobs and so, it's really important work. It's I think it's something that people really took for granted. Right. You know, that these yeah, kids and one have of my grand go. I have seven grandkids and one of my grandkids, uh, he's in college now, but he he has uh uh he was uh, he's autistic mm. and um but he's you know very great he's a great kid, great kid. He's in Texas now. Mm -hmm. And I have uh my oldest grandkid is twenty two. He's he's a senior at uh Rice University. He's about to uh graduate uh, in May. Wow. So, yeah. Starts sounding weird when it's like kids and yeah. grandkids and I got I have a grandkid who just graduated, so I really oh feel goodness. old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see me and Valina, we started late. So our yeah. son's just getting ready to start college. Right. And so it's like on the one and it's like we're a we're a generation behind on that. Right. But uh but it's fun. It's still fun. Yeah. But anyway, let's get to let's get to talking to you. So start wanna start off like with everybody and starting off with where were you born? I was born in Washington, D.C. at Georgetown University Hospital. Mm. So you, what were your parents doing in in, uh, in Georgetown or in Washington, D.C.? My dad was in his last year of law school at Georgetown. He was in the uh, first class that admitted uh, black people into Georgetown. Really? And, uh, into the law school. And um, so he was like, you know, a pathfinder, a trailblazer. Mm -hmm. And he, he later became a lawyer for the NAACP. Wow. So how did he get on the path to being a lawyer? Well, how was that something interesting to him or his parents were into it or what? My grandfather influenced him to be a lawyer. He said you could use the law to create social change. And um, my dad, my brothers and I were the plaintiffs in a lot of civil rights lawsuits back in the mm. day uh, to integrate schools, to integrate camps. To integrate movie theaters, you know, a lot of different wow. stuff. So, yeah, my my dad kept using us as the plaintiffs, in a, you know, and especially <laughs> like the camps, you know. So uh -huh. that's kind of I got my social activism from him. And it sounds like he got it from his parents. Yeah, he got it from his parents. Hmm. Yeah, my grandfather was a laborer, but he had a uh, great ambition for his children. All. All three of his children were college educated. Wow. Yeah. And only, and, and, oh, go ahead. And only one of my aunts for my father's family is still alive. She's retired in Richmond, Virginia, hmm. which is where my parents were from, Richmond, Virginia. Um, mm -hmm. They met in D.C., though, at Union Station. They were both there to meet somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> And they met each other, and the story goes that they had a two-week courtship. <laughs> That's quick. <laughs> so what was your mother doing in D.C.? My mother worked for the federal government. She was four years older than my father. Um, mm -hmm. During World War II, she went up to, to D.C. to work for the federal government. She worked for the uh, Coast Guard uh, 
department as a clerical worker. And then later, when I was in high school, she worked for Arlington County Public Schools in Arlington, Virginia, as a, as a community liaison for this group called Flow for the Love of Wakefield. We had a lot of racial issues at Wakefield High School. Um, I was I went to segregated uh, Drew Elementary School in Arlington, Virginia, from mm -hmm. um, from kindergarten to the uh, sixth grade, and then I went to a a integrated Gunston Junior High School for the seventh, eighth, and ninth grade, and then I went to integrated Wakefield High School uh, for the tenth, eleventh, and twelfth grade, and we had a lot of issues at Wakefield. Um, I led the Black Student Union there. And we had mm -hmm. many bo uh, boycotts over the curriculum and different things, uh, which I and a guy named Joe Davis uh, led. When you were going to Wakefield, you're saying that, uh, uh, so it was like recently integrated or had it been integrated for a while? It had been, the first time it had been integrated was when I was in the uh, seventh grade, was when Arlington County Schools became integrated. Oh, Okay. Yeah. So it had only been a few years by the time you right. got there. Right. By the time I got to Wakefield, it had only been integrated for about three years. And and what was the ratio like at that point? Um, majority white, um, some Asian, some Hispanic, um, a good black population. Um, you know, because we were right outside of Washington D.C. Mm -hmm. And um, we had a lot of drugs in our community, especially heroin. Mm. Um, one of our star basketball players died of a heroin overdose. This guy really? named Michael Jones, during his senior year, he uh, overdosed of heroin. So I mean, that was you know you couldn't find soft drugs like marijuana and stuff, but you could find the hard stuff. And uh, uh -huh. that's just you know, the community was called Green Valley, uh, as part of Arlington County, and uh -huh. uh, it was a small community, but uh. Everybody knew each other, uh, more or less. And um, there was just a lot of drugs there. There was just, you know, hmm. you know, the, you know, it's just sad. It was just totally sad. Had that been, you're saying, so a lot of drugs in the, in the community. And, and this was like, my parents moved to Alexandria, Virginia in like 1974, while I was a student mm -hmm. at Oberlin College. And, um, they moved to an, an integrated neighborhood. They had a real big house, four bedroom house, my mother's dream house. And, um, but prior to 1974, you know, we was just, you know, had been redlined into that little black community in Green Valley. So, you know, uh, it's kind of weird mm -hmm. that um, when Carolyn and I moved to California and we bought a house in Oakland, we had been redlined <laughs> into a ghetto. So, you know, it's like I went from a ghetto in the East Coast to a ghetto in the West Coast. This is kind of weird. And well, people think that, you know, that's one of the things we're like, you know, struggling against so much stuff that's been in the news nowadays, which is great that things are, are, are in the news. But also when it comes to redlining and segregation, there's this idea that that was a long time ago. Now right. we're dealing with this new stuff, and it's like it wasn't that long ago, and it is direct, directly related to many of the problems that we still have. Obviously, right. you know that these problems have roots that reach back hundreds and hundreds of years, and so the idea that oh well now we we've, we've made all of these great strides, and now there's you know uh, and there's still so much further to go. It's like yeah that's true, but even those strides were recent, you know. Yeah. And and not as permanent as people think they are, you know. Yeah. As like they say, with San Francisco is more segregated than it used to be, than it was in the seventies and eighties. That's because of the cost of the housing, right? Black but also it has to, to do with in San Francisco. Yeah, and now black more... people can't really afford to live in Oakland. I mean, you know, yeah. the Bay Area in general, because of Silicon Valley, is just sky high. Mm -hmm. Right. You know? Having the millionaires move in, and then the schools become de facto segregated. By having, uh, 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 you know, people not being able to live in in the districts, and and having, you know, so you end up with like like my son goes to Balboa, and Balboa still has a really diverse uh, student body, but I know it's gotten less diverse in the last ten years because I've been teaching, I teach out there every once in a while, and I've right. seen this the the demographic just slowly shifting from having like thirty percent of the students be black to like one black student, you know, right. um. 
And so it's it is ends up being a de facto segregation by having white enclave cities that used to be diverse becoming white enclaves. Um, so, but I wanted to ask you. So, uh, with your mother now, did she come from a from an activist family like your father did? Um, I, I really don't know. My um, my grandmother on my mother's side was had already passed away when I was born. Uh, she came from a large family of eleven kids. Wow. And um, and I, I met her father. I mean, I, you know, they lived in Richmond, Virginia, and um. For the summers, you know, I would go down there and stay with my, my grandmother and grandfather on my father's side. But we would visit, you know, the relatives on my mother's side. You know, and, you know, I don't know. My my grandfather on my mother's side was a maitre d' at a restaurant. Hmm. And um, he had worked himself up from being a waiter to being a maitre d'. And, um, you know, it was a good family, man, and, you know, big family. And he was there, yeah. you know, and, uh, you know, um, I, I, I think I got most of the activism from my father's side of the family. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, my father was, my father had, had a group called Black Thunder when he was a kid in high school. And they used to go around Richmond, Virginia, <clears throat> turn down the white only and black only signs. Mm-hmm. That hmm. were in white, at water fountains and, you know, public restrooms. Hmm. And Black Thunder, I think, is the name of an anthology or a, a book by Anna Bontemps, who was around hmm. during the Harlem Renaissance. And um, that's where my dad got that name from. So uh, that's, wow. and I ain't your uncle, the posse that uh, George Harris is leading is called Black Thunder. And you know, that was a nod to my father. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, it sounds like, I mean, one of the things that's great is uh, uh, it sounds like you grew up around enough of both sides of your family so that you did get to at least know them. You right, weren't like, right. you know, your parents weren't like pioneers or immigrants and, and right. uh, separated from their family. So they were right there. So there was some right. some support. Yeah. And, and the Arlington, Virginia, D.C. area was only 100 miles away from Richmond. So. You know, it was, yeah. you know, a couple hours in the car and you're there. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, they, they had, it was a close, both families were pretty close. Oh, that's good. Yeah. So, so you were saying before uh, that you, you, you and uh, your siblings were, were plaintiffs in some of your father's cases. Right. <laughs> how did that go? How did, how did that happen? Well, I, you know, um, mainly we were plaintiffs in name only. You know, it's mm -hmm. not like we had to show up at court, you know. Oh, okay. <laughs> and complain. But, you know, because of our age group, you know, um, like when when I was six, uh, my dad took us to this place called Ponyland in Annandale, Virginia. Mm -hmm. And um, they wouldn't let us in. And it was the first time I heard the N-word. The white guy used the N-word in plural when he said, mm -hmm. you know, no N-word allowed. Mm -hmm. And... Um, so I had to ask my dad, you know, what what did he mean by that? And that was the, that was the day I became really aware of racial differences between blacks and whites. Mm -hmm. And you know, there was a helicopter flying overhead when we were driving home, and I remember asking my dad, "Is the pilot of that helicopter uh, black or white?" And my dad said. Most likely, he's probably white, you know. Mm -hmm. And then I, you know, began to, for the first time, see how small I was in the world, and how mm. limited my opportunities were. Uh, mm. But you know, um, my parents instilled a lot of self confidence in me and my brothers. And um, you know, my dad used to make us learn five new words a week. Wow. And I think you know, in my play Willie Bot Willie Drop, I make a joke out of that. I, the father character says, you know, I'm preparing you to be a writer. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> learn the white man's language and, uh, you know, defeat him with it. You mm -hmm. know, so, uh, you know, I, again, you know, my love of English, my love of theater, I got that from my parents. My parents took us to see plays um, in D.C. that came to him, productions that came to the National Theater. Like we saw Hair. We saw the wow. River Niger. 
Mm. We saw um, we saw my fair lady and um, hmm. Sound of Music. <laughs> wow. We saw a it's lot of that stuff. A lot of classics. Yeah, yeah. So they liked yeah. musicals, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Oh, but I, actually, I wanted to go back but to the you. The really turned me on to wow, not black a... people could write, you know, and um, yeah, right. And it's supposed to be the Negro Ensemble too. Company, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Uh, hmm. That was, you know, and then the school teachers that I had uh, at Wakefield, the two black teachers that I had were uh, Miss Sullivan, Constance Sullivan. She turned me on to the autobiography of Malcolm X hmm. and Man, Child in the Promised Land by Claude McKay and hmm. um, Richard Wright, you know, Native Son, Uncle Tom's Children, different books that he wrote, The Outsider. And, um, from reading those books, you know, I, I knew at a young age I wanted to write. I knew as early as high school that I wanted to write. And I was writing very bad poetry in high school. But uh, Everybody I was inspired was writing by bad the, poetry in high school. <laughs> right. I was inspired by the last poets. Um, mm -hmm. uh, they had a few albums out and uh, I used to listen to them. And I, I read I led a group of young poets and uh, musicians, Congo. Congo players called, uh, we called ourselves Young, Gifted, and Black after the Lorraine Hansberry song and a uh, play and the Nina Simone uh, mm -hmm. song. And, um, you know, we used to tour uh, Northern Virginia with reciting our very bad poetry <laughs> to Congo <laughs> drums. But, uh, you know, I was in the local newspapers and I oh, was yeah. in the Washington Post and uh, the Northern Virginia Sun. Uh, in high school. Um, well, these, these were articles that you'd written? Yeah, for, you know, or poetry for espousing my very bad poetry. <laughs> yeah, but it's but it's like uh, having that kind of um, uh, reinforcement, uh, you know, to have, you know, because most people, it couldn't have been that bad because yeah. most people write it and it doesn't go anywhere. No, their parents yeah. don't even like it. So if yeah. your stuff was getting printed somewhere, it must have been speaking to them in a way that they were like, well, it's a high school student, but, you know, we should put this, we should print this. Right, right. Well, I, I, know, there was one question um, I had, though. I wanted, I actually wanted to go back to one thing. Okay. Still to, this question about your parents meeting on the train, <laughs> on, on the platform. At a train station, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So who were they there to meet? Did those people ever get met? They, they were both there to meet somebody else. This is just, mm -hmm. that's all I know. That's the only huh. information I have on it. How did um, they and start again, talking? And again, according to to the you know the story, they had a two week courtship. So, you know, so did, did I, I didn't come along mother? until how, how like they after they got married. I I, I I came along like three years later because mm -hmm. my dad was still at Howard University when he met my mom. Oh, okay. And he was there on the GI Bill. From he was a veteran of World War Two. Mm, so, really? Uh, yeah, yeah. Did he? Where was he in? Did he go overseas or what? He was stationed in the Philippines most of the time, and wow. he was on latrine duty most of the time. <laughs> well, he, in the he was black the most of the time. That'll do it. Right. Yeah. Mm. But it so, played, you know, GI Bill got him, um, got him through Howard, got him through Georgetown Law School, and got him uh, a down payment on their first house in Arlington, Virginia. Wow. So, yeah, we moved. I was about four or five when we moved to the house in Arlington and in, in that Green Valley neighborhood that I was talking about. Mm hmm. OK. And I just they bought the house for sixteen thousand dollars. Oh, no. That hurts. <laughs> that hurts. You can't pay rent like for sixteen thousand now. Oh, man. Oh, well, that, but that was the days when the GI Bill right. actually meant something. And Right, and, right, right. Uh, that whole generation of soldiers that came back and they were like, I mean, I know economically the government was like, we don't want all these people to just jump into the job market because it's going to mess something up. So let's pay them to go to college so we right. won't have all this unemployment. And it was it was a brilliant idea and it helped all of these families, you know, kind of um, move out of the, the last remnants of the Depression. And it helped a lot of black families, you know, yeah. across the South, a lot of veterans. Even right. though the army had treated them badly, they still came out with something. Right, right. So most of them. Yeah, you most know, of them. The GI Bill didn't work for everybody. <laughs> no, 
No. But my I mean, father was smart. He knew how to take advantage of the system. So. Yeah, I mean, my my father, he's he was in the army uh, during the Korean War period, okay. and he didn't he didn't fight or he just you know was a radio man in New Jersey, but yeah. um, his GI Bill helped both of my sisters buy houses like, thirty years later, forty years oh, okay. later, he cool. could still use the GI Bill even though he only did one term. I mean, he did yeah. you know, one thing, but it still, you know, and then younger veterans were like, we can't do that now. And I was like, yeah, but he was in there before it kind of got dismantled a little bit. Yeah. So, so your father, uh, when he he gets out of uh, gets out of Georgetown, and um, so he decided to stay in D.C. Your parents both decided to stay right there and work. Yeah, yeah. Well, they moved to Arlington because at that time, people, the DC, citizens of D.C. were not allowed to vote. Hmm. And right now, and they still call themselves the last colony because mm -hmm. their representative, Eleanor Holmes Norton, doesn't have a vote in Congress. She can say, she can, you know, speak and stuff, but she can't vote on any issues. So mm -hmm. um, citizens in D.C., they can vote now for president and stuff and the local, you know, uh, politicians for the mayor and all of that. But back in the day, you know, um, the first mayor of D.C. during my lifetime was appointed by the federal government, a guy mm. named uh, Walter Washington. And then after him, they started electing the mayor for D.C. But D.C. Oh. is really messed up. The, the control, you know, that's why people in the citizens in D.C. are fighting for statehood. They want to become the right. 51st state, you know. And, the, um, I think the House of Representatives just passed that. And really? now it's in the Senate. Yeah, just like yesterday. Oh really? Um, yeah, straight okay. party line vote, and now it's going to go to the uh, go to the Senate. And they were saying that, oh, it's got to go be a constitutional. The Republicans are like, it's got to be a constitutional amendment. I'm like, no, it doesn't. The yeah. Senate, they just vote on it. And so we'll see what happens. But yeah. this is the closest DC has been to statehood. And of course, the Republicans are saying it's just that the Democrats want two, you know, two black liberal senators. And it's right, like that's right. all it's about. And it's like, right. yeah, no, no, no. That's why you don't want it to be right. a state. Well, so, part of my dad's reason for moving to Virginia was so that they could vote. He was reg helping to register black people to vote uh, for uh, John Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when it, when we were kids, we met Robert Kennedy. Um, really? Yeah. Um, uh -huh. And we met uh, Hubert Humphrey, who was vice president under Lyndon Johnson. Mm -hmm. Um you know, my my dad was taking us places all the time. I mean, you know, I saw Martin Luther King preach at Lomax Methodist Church in uh, Arlington, Virginia. Wow. And um, I was, you know, I was very young. And um, like I was 10 when the March on Washington happened. My dad participated in that. Um, you know, he marched with Dr. King. Um, but, you know, again, my dad being kind of a radical you know, wanting, you know, equal opportunities for black people kind of fed into what I ended up writing as a, as in my very bad poetry. You know, I was <laughs> do writing. Still have any, do, do you still have any of your very bad poetry? No. Oh, damn. <laughs> it would be great to just hear a little bit of it. Just a little bit. <laughs> but, um, you know, I was writing about the drug ep epidemic in Green Valley in a mm -hmm. poem I wrote called, Do You Think You're Black? And it was about a, uh, you know, um, down on the corner, the white man stands. He got your fix in his hand. That's all I remember. <laughs> That's that all I remember. All. That, says, that says it all. <laughs> so you were thinking about writing, or, or did you did you have your mind fixed? Did you know what that meant to say? You know, I'm going to be a writer. You know, like uh, trying to make a living and everything. Everybody that I knew told me you were stupid. You know, you need to think about something that you're going to make money. Your dad's a lawyer. Why did you think about being a lawyer? You know, <laughs> uh, I think I would have been a terrible lawyer. And, <laughs> you would have been a theatrical lawyer. Huh? you have been a theatrical lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> and speaking in poetry. Um, so wh now, when did you tell your parents that you were thinking about being a writer? Um... I mean, well, did you have I, I know they knew in college because um, 
while I was a student at Oberlin College in Ohio, I uh, was majoring in English, minoring in cre creative writing and African American studies. And um, I got into a program at Columbia University. I spent one semester in New York. Um, and my dad drove me up to New York and we met with the guy who was my uh, contact person, a guy named Damon Brazewell. Uh, he was a playwright and writer, novelist, theater person. Uh, we went to his apartment and he gave me the bad news that there was no housing for me on campus. Mm. So uh, my dad said, well, um, I got an idea. Why don't you stay at the Sloan House when I'm CA? And apparently he had stayed there many times when he took trips up to New York when he was young. Hmm. So I ended up at the Sloan House YMCA uh, for the semester that I was there. I was there for five months. Wow. And um, I ended up writing a novel about living in the Sloan House YMCA called <laughs> The Sandman and the Dreamer. Mm -hmm. And um, I met my wife, Carolyn, uh, she was uh, at Columbia in the, in the grad school program getting a master's in library science. And wow. we met at a subway station near Columbia's campus. I was asking her for directions to get back downtown. And um, and she said, okay, oh, you're not from here. This is a theme for you guys. Meeting yeah. at train stations is a thing. Train station, subway station. <laughs> yeah, right. And um, so Carolyn and I, you know, we didn't date at that time, but... Um, we ended up meeting years a few a couple of years later after I graduated from Oberlin. Uh, we met at a club called Raphael's, and um, was this back in New York? This is uh, now this club is in D.C. She Damn. is from D.C. She told me I oh, told okay. her I was from Island, Virginia, oh. and she told me she was from D.C. And when I met her on the subway station, she had on this Motown T-shirt, mm -hmm. you know, and um. So when we met in D.C. after her after her dad died, she moved back to D.C. to be near her mom, and um, we were hanging out. I was working for Island County Public Schools as a, a homebound instructor, teaching kids that had been kicked out of the school, but they had to you know mm. still learn. So I would go into their house and teach them. I had like three students on my caseload, and. Um, me and Carolyn decided to play hooky from work one day. She was working as a librarian at this place called Shop Health High School in uh, D.C. And um, when we, you know, got ready to leave, she put on the Motown T-shirt. And I figured out, I knew you. I met you in New York. Oh, when I so you, the second, you didn't know I that didn't, before. I connected the first time, you know. Huh. But I, I realized that when she put the Motown T-shirt that I had met her before like three years earlier. Wow. And so it was just kind of weird, you know, kismet, you know. <laughs> yeah, seriously. seriously. And the way things happen. But, uh, uh, I was going to ask you, uh, why did you decide to go to Oberlin? You know, to go that I far saw, in college? Uh, they were, uh, two students from Oberlin were on the cover of Time Magazine. And the, the headline on the co-ed dormitories at Oberlin College. And uh -huh. so, you know. The idea of a co-ed dorm, you know. <laughs> kind of attracted, yeah. Attracted me to Oberlin and not the <laughs> academics. <laughs> but I, you know, I applied to Howard, Syracuse. Uh, I got in every school I applied to. And, uh, mm -hmm. and I went to Oberlin because, you know, when I st studied up on them and, you know, when I learned about, you know, their liberal history. Very, and, yeah. And, uh, being one of the first schools that admitted blacks and being... You know, one of the first schools that had uh, Native Americans and women and all that. You know, I, I saw how progressive Oberlin was supposed to be. And and my education was pretty crazy. Um, I did a winter term project out here in California, uh, in East Palo Alto. And while I was there, I visited Oakland, San Francisco. And that's when I fell in love with the Bay Area. Um, mm. And so having lived in New York through Oberlin, and having, you know, spent time in the Bay Area through Oberlin, I just, me and Carolyn said, let's, you know, move to uh, to the Bay Area. So I applied to San Francisco State 
uh, I submitted my novel and my first play, The Hourglass, and uh, I got it accepted into their creative writing program. It was a, a master's program at the time. It wasn't an MFA program. But it was just a master's. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we came out here, and uh, I only went to uh, San Francisco State for one year before I dropped out uh, because, you know, my son was born, and I got a job at the Urban League. And, uh, I was working mm -hmm. – um, I did the interview in San Francisco, but I ended up working in Oakland. Mm -hmm. uh, this thing called the On the Job Training Program, and mm -hmm. um, and Carolyn ended up getting a job at Laney College. So we were commuting to Oakland from San Francisco. From San Francisco, and, and we got tired of the commute, so we ended up finding like a house do. in Oakland. So and, uh, I, I, and then I that's when I dropped out of the program at <laughs> San Francisco State. What? Because I stayed active as a playwright, um, all of my credits were still active. And then when later, when Carolyn and I split up and I went to, uh, thanks to Idris Cooper, Ani Fawoshe, yeah. I went to uh, the University of Iowa. Iowa, yeah. She was, she was already there. And she was the one that turned me on to this uh, fellowship called the Patricia Roberts Harris Fellowship. And so they were paying me to live there I could pay my rent. It was dirt cheap. And, and uh, the cheapest place I'd ever been was Iowa City, Iowa. I mean, mm. the insurance on my car was like $35 a month. <laughs> wow. wow. <laughs> you know, I was paying like $300 of rent, you know. And uh, huh. this is 1995 and 96 right. that right. I was paying that. You know, so that was, it showed you what That's the cost of living is so different in this used country. To be. Yeah. Used to be. So I actually want to go back to you, the novel that you wrote when you were in New York. Yeah. So you wrote it in the five months that you were staying at the Y? I, I wrote it. Um, I continued. No, I didn't get the idea to write it until after I left. Um, oh, uh-huh. Um, my I, I was there. I was in the five months. I was in um, New York was the first semester of my junior year. So mm -hmm. all of my senior year at Oberlin, I was working on it. Mm -hmm. And then after I graduated, the first year I was out of, uh, I was at home in D.C., I was still working on it. Mm -hmm. And then after Carolyn and I hooked up, she helped me get an agent for it with the William Morris Agency. Because she wow. had also, while she was uh, attending grad school, she was working as a uh, editor at Doubleday and at Third mm -hmm. Press uh, in New York. So she had wow. connections. And um, my first agent was this guy named Mel Berger at, at the William Morris Agency. And we had a near deal on Sam and the Dreamer, but it, it fell through. Mm. Um, what was it about, the book? I mean, it was and, and, loosely semi-autobiographical, but very dark. <laughs> uh -huh. Very dark. I don't really want to go into <laughs> what okay. it was about. But, uh, you know, so it made the rounds. And, um, uh huh. And people, and they were also representing the Hourglass, and um, the Hourglass ended up getting published in an anthology called Center Stage, um, that was edited by um, Elaine Austral. Uh, she had Sea Urchin Press out of Oakland, California, mm. and uh, because the Hourglass was in the anthology, it ended up getting a lot of productions around the country. And then my second play, Home Free, was in West Coast Plays which was edited at that time by Rick Foster. And mm -hmm. that ended up getting produced in D.C. So my parents got to see two of my plays in D.C. because they were in anthologies. And then they saw Our Ancient Uncle when the mom troop came to Merlin, um, mm. the play to Merlin, and my, my parents went to see it. And then there was a blackout after the play. And um, that's all I heard about, you know. They complained <laughs> that there was a blackout. <laughs> they thought it was racially motivated. Probably was, probably was. <laughs> but so, anyway, so, and then I'll, they I'll, saw the Mozam Cola caper at the Kennedy Center. Wow. Um, that was a mind true play that uh, I worked mm -hmm. on with Joan and John O'Neill. So they saw that. So they got to see some of my work. Uh, the play that I wish they had saw, though, was Air Guitar. I wish they had flown out to the Bay Area and saw that. Uh, that's my yeah. biggest regret uh, because I tried so, to show them a very bad videotape of it and uh, it was kind of disoriented. <laughs> yeah, you got that show needed to be seen in in person. That because right. 
I mean, either it needed to be in person or it needed to be a film, but right. not a video of the show because it was so right. dreamy and so much stuff going on. And right, right, yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask about like so the the shift, you know, that that you know some people do in different ways between you were writing po bad poetry, then you write a novel, which is this huge leap, not like short story, short story, but to write a novel, and then go into playwriting. So what was that? Why did you make that that shift as opposed to continuing on as a novelist? Well, I saw the Taking of Miss Janie at the Back Alley Theater in D.C. Uh, while Carolyn and I were dating. And I was so blown away by the play that I called Carolyn. We didn't go that we didn't go see it together that day, but I called her and I said, I think I'm gonna be a playwright. I said, hmm. I think I'm gonna write for theater. And then and what and what I ended up being drawn to was the community of the community that builds the play, that you know, mm -hmm. devote that produces the play, and then the community that witnesses the play, the audience. And hmm. um, and so and and writing, having recited bad poetry, kind of made to me you know, the idea of trying to maybe write bad dialogue. <laughs> well, but I guess dialogue also turned out to be pretty good as I got older. Yeah. Well, so also since you were performing the poetry, it was right, already right. theatricalized. It wasn't just literary. It was already right. performative. Right. So. Hmm. So yeah, because that's you know for a lot of people that's that's a hard leap, yeah. you know, to make that shift to to uh, you know writing when you were, your novel was it um, you know first person narrative was it God voice? No, it was third person. Mm hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, because like I said, making that shift, I've known a lot of people who who you know they're writing short stories and then they go, yeah, I want to write a short play, and it's the play is still like a short story, you know? They have a yeah. hard time stepping away from a narrative voice. Well, I originally wrote The Hourglass as a short story, and Carlin, you know, um, we were in a workshop at Howard University that we used to go to and attend on a regular basis, led by this uh, novelist named John O'Killens. And um, I also, he was also used to teach at Columbia, so... Um, I was exposed to him at, in New York and hmm. back in D.C. when he was a visiting professor at Howard. And um, when I read, you know, I, the story was read in, at the workshop and everybody loved it. And then a couple of people said, you know, you can make that into a play. You can make that hmm. into a play. And so I just, you know, started getting, you know, how to write playbooks, you know, and Mm. And just, you know, kind of self-taught myself to write plays. I had written two very bad plays as a, a student at Oberlin. Um, mm -hmm. But they had some way out, some far out ideas. I wrote a play called A Political Fairy Tale. And I wrote a play called uh, The Battle of Boogaloo. And in hmm. The Battle of Boogaloo, there was a character named He Said, She Said, which was a, a man and a woman in a, uh, in a suit together. And then... Uh, that character ended up being very much like Armageddon Man in, in the huh. Mind Troops back when versus Armageddon Man because Chumley and Bruce Barthol were in the suit where they were, you know, two two characters in in one suit, yeah. you know. Kinda, yeah, war and so, uh, business and war. So it was kind of funny how that idea, you know, came back, you know. Huh. And it wasn't my idea to put that in Armageddon Man. I, you yeah. know, I had very few lines in Armageddon Man. Mm. Oh, I wanted to ask you about the hourglass because you know you wrote it as a short story and then you adapted it as a play and it become it sounds like it's your first real professional. It was my play. first real play. Yeah. And, so what, you know, what, they what did a about? play stage reading of it at at uh, when I was a student at San Francisco State. They did a stage reading of it, and at the near the end, as the play was coming to the climax, um, one of the characters accidentally, you know. Fell into a uh, a when a flat and it fell mm -hmm. on top of her and the director jumped out of the audience and said that's not in the script that's not in the script <laughs> <laughs> so that was my, is clear. yeah that was my introduction to theater <laughs> what well, what was the hourglass my, about you know, my my mother in law was with me in the audience because you know she had come out there to visit us while we were taking care of you know young Robert and um. You know, Rob was an infant, and um, 
it was just it was just like I was so embarrassed. <laughs> you know? But Chewbacca ended up directing that play at the Bureau Clay Theater. Really? And uh, in, a, in a festival that uh, John A. Williams, I mean, John Williams, who ended up changing his name to Jamal Williams, mm -hmm. um, produced. And um, he had a play called Bloodlines to Oblivion in the festival, yep. which was about um, a family leaving to go to Jonestown, which is, I think, is a very underrated play. And I think yeah. he's a very underrated playwright. And then yeah, also John cool. Hatch had a play called Episodes from an Ancient Script. And then mm -hmm. my play, The Hourglass, was part of the festival. And so we had, like, each one of us had a, a one week of performances in the festival. And mm. my, my play was the last to go on. And, um, and it's the one that went on to more acclaim than, you yeah. know, because of the I'm trying to remember what with Bloodlines to Oblivion, might it ended up getting done at the uh, Julian Theater too. Yeah, John Doyle. yeah. I'm trying to Jamal remember. Jamal directed the version show. of it. Jamal directed the version of it at the Burial Clay Theater. Mm -hmm. His production of it, I thought, was better than John Doyle's production at the mm -hmm. Julian. Even though more money was spent on the Julian production, mm -hmm. you know, because we had a shoestring budget for <laughs> for our little festival at the Burial Clay Theater. Hmm. But uh, yeah, I wow. still have a poster uh, of the hourglass at the Bureau Clay Theater. Uh, it's in the bathroom at my ex-wife's house. <laughs> <laughs> she has <laughs> posters <laughs> of my ancient uncle up in the house and uh, the Mind Troop version and other companies' uh, versions, uh, like hmm. especially the Harper Stage version. They had a crazy uh, poster for my ancient uncle. They had a, a one of those blackface. Uh, caricatures of a black face with big mm -hmm. lips set on fire. I've and, seen that one. Yeah, yeah it was in America. It was published in American Theater Magazine. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. sure. Yeah. That that's what would yeah, be. Kim Ewan was responsible for me getting that production. She really? was working at Hockey Stage at the time. She was oh. running a program called Voices, and she was working as you know a dramaturg and literary manager. And she, you know, had scheduled a reading. Of, Serving other people was read first, and then I Ain't Your Uncle was read second. And they really, really loved I Ain't Your Uncle. Um, it got a, like the whole house gave it a, a standing ovation. And the artistic director, Mark Lambert, said, We're going to do your play. You know, mm -hmm. and um, that and, and the play ended up being done while I was a student at the University of Iowa. So while mm -hmm. I was in Iowa, I was flying in and out of Iowa because I had something, a prep at Ellen Garden was being workshopped. At the Mark Taper Forum, that's a play about gang banging. That was uh, the play that I wrote as a companion piece of Servant of the People. I wanted to show in Servant of the People, I showed the gun being used for political purposes, and in um, a preface to the Ellen Garden, I was showing the gun in the black community being used for criminal purposes, and mm -hmm. you know, and, and that gun was chased was traced from I Ain't Your Uncle when uh, George Harris gives Uncle Tom the gun that uh, Cassie ends up shooting Simon Degree with. So that was mm. my, you know, I was trying to, you know, do a, a little thesis on A little gun. gun trilogy. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. Well, that's fine, Simon. That's one of those win the lottery and do a theater festival right. play things. And it's like three nights of these shows. <laughs> See them back to back. And yeah, yeah, that'd be right. fun. Um, so when you were like, so you get out to San Francisco, you're, I'm going to kind of go back a little bit because when you were, so you were at State and that's where you met Jamal. You, he was teaching out yes. there? He was, um, I met him because I just met him in the community. He had already graduated from the MA program. Him and Burial Clay, they had already graduated. And Burial Clay was like teaching out there part time, uh, but he wasn't teaching in any classes I was in. But we ran into each other and I handed him a copy of the Hourglass. And, um, I just, you know, uh, Jamal was leading a workshop of playwrights in the community that met at the uh, Western Edition Cultural Center. And we decided to put on a festival of plays. And hmm. uh, so that's how me and Jamal hooked up. Jamal and I, during one of the times when Carolyn and I were separated, uh, like while I was driving a cab in San Francisco for Yellow Cab, um, Jamal and I ended up uh, in our house together. We were roommates. We were both separated from our significant others at the time. 
Mm -hmm. So Jamal and I have a, a tremendous history. He lives in upstate New York now. Yeah. Um, and he uh, he runs a program that meets in Harlem uh, mm -hmm. of playwrights. He's still so right. He's still at it. Oh, yeah. He had one of his lungs. You know, he was a lifetime cigarette smoker. So he's had one of his lungs removed, you know, and. Oh, uh, God. Yeah, it's not but good. But I know he's still writing. I was in touch with him like yeah. a couple years oh, yeah, ago. He just had a play done at. Uh, the Lorraine Hansberry did a little thing where they were, uh, had a little three play festival mm -hmm. at the African American uh, Center Cultural Complex. Yeah. And one of his plays was Pitt. Uh, he didn't win the, I think the, one, the first place uh, prize was $7,000. But he was a mm. runner up, him and another play. Yeah. Uh, another play, right. Yeah. I didn't yeah, see that. that. I heard about it. Yeah, I was, uh, yeah. I was, uh, yeah, I read those plays. Yeah. So, so that, and I was in touch with him because I was going back to New York for something. And I was like, oh, I want you to come and see one of my shows. Um, but, and I did his show and I did LBJ. So, right, right. And I was trying to remember, I thought that Bloodlines to Oblivion might have been one of the first shows that I ever auditioned for. I didn't right. get in it, but I remember right. the show because I was living in Western Edition at okay. the time. I was living not that far away from People's Temple, you know, and right. my sister had gone there a couple times. And so, you know, the storyline and everything was was kind of resonant for our family. Right, right. Yeah. It um, was a very timely play when it was done. Yeah, and something that it was needs definitely to be a San Francisco play. <laughs> yeah, that's always the hard thing. It's like you write something that's so it's like, you know, you want to write something that's going to be mean a lot to the community right then. You know, it's like Mind Troop shows. You want to write something that's going to mean something right now and maybe predict a little future a little bit, but then a few years from now, people are going to be like, "Ah, that's not our issue," or out of that area. You know, yeah. it's it's tough to kind of be topical and uh, uh, immortal. At the same right. time, right. Uh, so, so now, how did you? Um, how did when? When did you? And how did you uh, become aware of the mime troupe? When, it, when we first moved to the Bay Area, they were in the newspaper all the time. They mm -hmm. were just, you know, every show they were doing. Um, and then Shabaka auditioned for the mime troupe and got in. Um, oh, yeah, right. And so then, when he was in, I started to go to their shows, and I met Joan and Chumley and all of them. And the next thing I knew, I was writing for them. Um, <laughs> like I did, a, I did, wrote a play called Home Free that Shabaka di uh, directed at uh, Black Repertory Group in Berkeley and at the Western Edition Cultural Center at the Bureau of Clay Theater. And like people like Brian Freeman, all of them mm -hmm. came to see it. So I was on the Mind Truth's radar. They were on my radar. And um, the first play that I ended up writing for them, where I was the main writer, was Secrets in the Sands. Mm, and um, mm -hmm. and that was about uh, John Wayne being exposed to radiation in Nevada uh, on the uh, set of a movie called The Conqueror. Yep. And um, it's a little, you know, it's, The Conqueror was a B movie, um, but, you know, we made a lot of fun out of John Wayne. Because <laughs> <laughs> John Wayne also smoked four packs of cigarettes a day. So he could have yeah. gotten the cancer. Either way. <laughs> from cigarettes. Yeah. From the Coming radiation. and going. So what was that like, that that kind of shift? Or did you feel like it was a shift in writing style for you? Definitely. From, you know, Hourglass and other stuff? The Hourglass was very personal, very lyrical. And um, Secrets in the Sands was funny. And a lot of one-liners in it. Um... um the year that I did Secrets in the Sands, I also did the Lorraine Hansberry produced We Almost Made It to the Super Bowl. And We Almost mm -hmm. Made It to the Super Bowl had a lot of one-liners in it. Shabaka was mm -hmm. in that play. He was the lead character, a character named Pepper Davis, and um, a running back. And that play ended up being optioned by the Negro Ensemble Company. And so that's how I ended up meeting Doug Ward first face-to-face. -face. And then they, Doug Ward and them came into town to put on a soldier's play with their touring cast that was touring them. And then Carolyn and I, because I had just got my play option, threw a cast party for uh, a soldier's play at, a, at my house in East Oakland. And so Samuel Jackson and all his people, you know, came to the house. Stephen Anthony Jones. Yeah. Um, you know, he was uh, in the touring he company stayed. for a soldier's play. Yeah. Um, a, a guy named... Uh, a 
playwright actor named uh, Eugene Lee came mm-hmm. to the house. Um, he's in, based in Texas now, but uh, he, he he works on a uh, regular basis. He's in a lot of August Wilson plays. In fact, he considers now, himself they... a Wilsonian actor. <laughs> <laughs> when, when you had that, do you have the cast party? Now, they already knew who you were because they yeah, already they, were looking at I had Super Bowl. Already, I had been to New York. I had been in a Doug's office in Midtown Manhattan. Um, mm-hmm. You know, they had paid me money, you know, <laughs> for the rights to my play, and so and I spent the money on the party. <laughs> uh, it wasn't a lot of money, but they ended up being broke. You know, after they did a soul display, they ended up broke. Um, that is so weird because they, they were such a they big They had hit. money when they first started the on, on something coming. They had a lot of money from the Ford Foundation. But they were producing their plays in a 200-seat house. So they never were able to pay for their shows from the box office Mm -hmm. because 200 seats is not that many. Um, They were just financially mismanaged. Uh Yeah, that was heartbreaking. And, you know, know, this was was the 80s. There was a lot of substance abuse. Mm. You know, I mean, Samuel Jackson talks openly about you know, his issues with drugs, you know. So, um, you know, there were rumors that, you know, that even Douglas Turner Ward had issues. So, uh, you that's, know, that's, uh, Adolf yeah. Caesar was in um, the cast of A yep. Soldier's Play. He had major issues with drugs. He he, he played Danny Glover's father in The, in, in the Color Purple. Mm-hmm. You know, you know with the little short guy with that deep voice. <laughs> with that deep voice. He had that yeah, growling yeah. voice. Right. <laughs> He talked like he was from the 40s. He had that kind of 1940s, like, gritty voice. Right. Hmm. But, you know, as times goes by, you know, you you live and you learn. Um, I recently sent a text to uh, David Allen. Yesterday, in fact, I sent him a text because Shock G passed away from Digital Underground. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Digital Underground started in the late 80s. In Oakland, and they was the group that responsible for bringing Tupac Shakur to fame, and um, so he died. He was he was back home in Tampa, Florida, but he was found in a hotel room. They don't know what he uh, passed away from, but the rumor is that he had you know serious drug problems and stuff, you know, and he had a couple yeah, times he had been in and out of jail on minor issues. So, but that's one of uh-uh. the problems of the black community. A lot of people in America think they have to buy the only high America has to offer. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I'm glad, you know, we were originally supposed to talk on the day that uh, the George Floyd, uh, Derek Chauvin verdict came in. But I was so burnt out from work. And then when I, you know, started seeing the the news reports about the verdict and stuff and saying, you know, well, it's finally some accountability for, you know, because nobody is... uh, Oscar Grant didn't get no accountability. You know, Emmett nope. Till didn't get no accountability. Trayvon Martin Taylor. didn't get no accountability. Yeah. Uh, Tamir Rice got no accountability. Michael Brown got no accountability. So yeah. finally, we got some accountability. But they still shooting black people. Cops, Today, you know, yesterday, in Oakland. Yesterday, right. You know, so when yeah. we need to have policemen's fear Policemen need to live in the communities that they patrol. They mm-hmm. need to know the people that they're interacting with. They can't see us as foreign objects, you know, right. subjects that they have to, you know, rule and control. Yeah. And, you know, they, and it needs to be some de-escalation of situations. Right. Uh, having expired contacts shouldn't necessarily mean being arrested, you know. No. You get a little ticket and you go on your way. You, you get know? a ticket, right? And then it's not it's not a life or death situation every right. time. It's like the number of times I'm sure for you, for me, you know, the number of times I've been pulled over by the police or stopped or talked to. I got pulled over on my bicycle one time, in oh, on really? by the police. I was riding my bike down. To, I mean, and and at that point, I'd been pulled over so many times, and I was in a bad mood that day. And so I'm riding my bike and a cop pulls up next to me and says, uh, where'd you get that bike from? And I said, from the store. And he said, where are you going to? And I said, that way. And he's like, where are you coming from? And I said, that way. Am I under arrest? 
And he said, well, I just need to ask you some questions. And I said, am I under arrest? And he said, no. And I said, well, then goodbye. And I rode off. Now, <laughs> that was kind of dangerous, <laughs> but I was pissed. That happened in San I, Francisco, though. Yeah. Oh, man, I had, I had cops pull guns and threaten to shoot me sitting in my own car in San Francisco in a neighborhood they didn't think I should be sitting in. Uh, my first experience with the cops in San Francisco is as a little kid, my whole family were all driving to the movies and we got pulled over and the cop openly said it. he pulled us over because he saw too many Afros in the car. <laughs> that was it. And and so we just got pulled over. And, you know, I've been pulled over, like I said, down the ground, gun on my head, all of that stuff for nothing. And so when we talked, you know, when 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 the uh, the verdict came in the other day. You know, and I went on Facebook and I put one down and then I just put a long line to go. <laughs> and people are like, oh, man, it's just a few. And I was like, are you kidding? It's thousands and thousands. It is a mentality that treats us as either runaway, dangerous slaves, uh, current perpetrators, or um, we are an occupied, you know, like Palestinians, you know, that we are in an occupied territory wherever in we the ghetto. are. And then they're on a ghetto patrol, which was the name of a song yeah. in Erotic Justice. Yo, mm -hmm. it's the ghetto patrol. <laughs> ghetto patrol, yeah. So that kind of um, how, how and that's the thing with your work, has been, you know, always pushing back against that, always trying to show the audience, for the, for the black audience, to show them uh, their, you know, our circumstance. And for the white audience to say, this is a way, this is, you know, this is what's going on right under your nose that you are not paying attention to, that you have accepted. You have accepted the brutality of the circumstance because it's not affecting you. And finally, now we're in a time where people are starting, I think because of COVID-19, they had to stay home and watch videos right. and, and watch because the news. they had the video, because we have smartphones, we can mm -hmm. tape this stuff. And we were lucky to have a tape of the Rodney King beating. I mean, yeah. that was sure luck back then that, that a guy the decided world, yeah. to take out his camera and film it. And mm -hmm. um and then to have that girl be on the scene when George Floyd was had the knee on his neck, um, that she videotaped all nine minutes and twenty nine seconds of it. And so there was just no way they could come back with any other verdict but guilty in all counts. Because they had the evidence, everybody has seen the evidence. You know, right. and they're gonna try they tried to blame George for his own death. They tried to say mm -hmm. it was the drugs in the system. He had an enlarged heart. You know, it was the uh, yeah. carbon monoxide coming from the tailpipe of the cops' car. <laughs> you know, all of these it excuses. Like, was it? But it was that, like you know, the, Eric Sheldon had the weakest defense I've ever. I mean, you know, that yeah, was they, just, they didn't even try. They did not right. even try. No, they. I think either either they they just knew he was going to be found guilty, and they were going to rely on the appeals. To right. try to say that the that the um, jury was so frightened that they couldn't find him not guilty, that it was you know some kind of uh, uh, terror, uh, cultural and community terrorism. Um, I don't know what which way they're going to go, but that that it is important, but it's also it's still so heartbreaking. It's like with that amount of evidence, with that number of eyewitnesses, with all of that stuff, it still took. All of these months for him to go to trial, and then three weeks of trial. The only part that made sense to me was I understood why it took 10 hours for the jury because it was three different counts, which means they had to go through each one. And I'm like, okay, if it was one count, just you, you, you killed a man, then it would have been shorter. Three counts, I was like, all right, 10 hours. They they crossed their T's and dotted their I's. It was still, but yeah, I mean, that was, never still short, that was still short. That was still kind of short, you know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I know that the defense attorney knew uh, when they came back that quickly that you're convicted. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it and it's it it is like I don't want people. I hope that people don't go to. Well, this is not a celebration. You don't celebrate, um, you know, the 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 justice that should be uh, taken for granted. I mean, it should be obvious because of a murder. Yeah, you know. Nobody's life is better. I, the people who are saying we shouldn't be celebrating this because he shouldn't be dead. The whole right. thing shouldn't have happened. Right. And so it is going to be. And like I said, with 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 your work, that the 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 view you have of things and the way that you show stuff in a very psychological, 
you know, way and also a very theatrical way, you know, using the form of theater rather than it just being what, you know, the uh, the black trauma, you know, stuff that's super popular right now. Right. Um, people misunderstanding what what, uh, you know, Jordan Peele and other artists like that. And it's like, oh, that's what we'll show. We'll just show black people getting whipped a lot. It's like, <laughs> we don't need to see that. And that's more. uh, uh it's like uh, it's some kind of catharsis for the white audience, but not for the black audience. The white audience could say, oh, my goodness, I feel terrible about that. And then just go about their lives. Yeah. Feeling like they did something by watching. Yeah. And like I said, so with your stuff with uh, and, and I, I was you know, I was talking to Valina saying I actually have done a good number of Robert's plays, <laughs> um, you know, with with air guitar and servant of the people. And I ain't your uncle. And erotic justice, and then your work with the mime troupe like uh, uh, rats, and these yeah. different things that you wrote. Yeah, so I was like, I've done like five plays of his. Um, seeing each one is so different, and that's another thing that I really like. You know, the shows that are like erotic justice is so lyrical with all of the with the the incorporation of music and also the 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 dream sequences. Yeah, and. Uh, the view inside someone's mind, whereas uh, plays and and also with um, air guitar being, you know, a, a, a really a an American dream in a yeah. way, you know, yeah. but a drug fueled American dream. Right. Cocaine, <laughs> a cocaine, cocaine rush. Stephen right. Wynn called it a theatrical cocaine rush. Well, that's what it was. I mean, it was it was <laughs> really. That that well, but Curtis it was Davis so... did a hell of a job directing that. And he, you know, he was working for the Negro Ensemble Company at the time. So, you know, and mm -hmm. my play was still on the option, you know. Um, so, you know, um, that was as close as I got to working with them. <laughs> I did do a workshop of uh Super Bowl in New York, but um um and I, you know, that was attended and it was received pretty well. And I thought they were gonna do it, but the cast size just, you know, their last season, they did two two, two per, people plays, one by Pearl Cleage and um, mm. that Georgia-based playwright, novelist. And um, and I can't think of the other play they did. But they, you know, they went out kind of like, you know, with a, not with a bang. <laughs> yeah. Mm. So now, would you say that You've been bouncing. You've bounced back and forth between comedy and drama, and you know, dream realism, and you know, really heavy. You know, all but all of it political, and talking about different aspects of oppression and the fight back against oppression. Um, is there a? Uh, uh, you were saying the thing about the gun being the through line through those three shows. Is that something that you feel like you're, you know, uh, uh, why do you think that's so important? that having that through line? Well, the gun has caused a health problem in cities like Chicago, LA, um, you know, with the gangs. And um, and when I wrote A Preface to the Alien Garden, I wanted to put kind of like an exclamation point on those three plays, you know, that started with My Ancient Uncle, which was an adaptation of Uncle Tom's Cabin for those who are not familiar with it. And, um, all the way through Servant of the People, which, you know, when I wrote I Ain't Your Uncle and we envisioned George Harris, I kind of saw him as Huey Newton, you know, or Nat Turner, as he mm -hmm. led Black Thunder from uh, from plantation to plantation before he got caught and hung, strung up in a tree. And um, with uh, I Ain't Your Uncle, I mean, with A Preface to the Alien Garden, I use hip-hop. That's also... Uh, I used the poetry of hip hop because there's like there like battle rhymes inside that play, and there's mm -hmm. dozens and um, they play the dozens in the play and uh, a lot of things that you know relate to black culture, and it's just the play is about a subculture of a subculture. Mm. Black culture in America is a subculture, gang culture is a subculture of a subculture. So you know I wanted to humanize these young kids that were out there. You know, Hillary Clinton called black kids super predators. Mm -hmm. You know, Donald Trump wanted to uh, send the uh, 
Central Park Five to the gas chamber. You know, he took out a full page ad in the New York Times when they were on trial. You know, execute these, you know, monsters, you know. Um, so, you know, with black people being seen as less than human, with us being seen as animals, with us being subject to slavery um, in this country and having the history of that, and then having Jim Crowism and having, you know, this long, long history of second class citizenship, and then having been turned away from Ponyland at the age of six. <laughs> well, I still want to ride those ponies. I still want to ride those ponies, you know. I'm still waiting to get on the pony, you know. So mm -hmm. this is, you know, I've been trying to write, you know, everything has been about erotic justice or social justice or some kind of justice, you know. Um, and having Topsy turn on the audience you know, after being, you know, played by Judy Garland in Blackface in a movie called Everybody Sings, I just wanted to turn that on the head. I wanted Topsy to be like Bigger Thomas. I wanted her to be the monster that this society created. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and this is what you're left with. Since you don't invest in us, since you lead us by the wayside, since you don't raise us, you know, this is what we have. You know, mm -hmm. we're left with that. We're left with a lot of black rage, a lot of black anger. But I've also written about white anger, too. I wrote a play called Hate Machine, which is mm. about two neo-Nazis that kidnap an interracial couple in, in Atlanta and hold them in a bunker in rural Georgia. And, um, and in that play, you deal with a lot of white rage. Uh, you deal with their insecurity of feeling that America is being overrun and overtaken by minorities, you know, mm -hmm. and that their voice... And their vote will no longer count. And as you see that the Republicans are trying to, you know, devalue the black vote right now in America because they hate to see the landslide that that Joe Biden won over Donald Trump. And yeah. they're still mad about that. And then, you know, and every Republican stronghold in this country is now doing doing overtime work to try to turn back the vote. They're trying right. to go back to Jim Crowism. They're trying to go back to the yeah. era of Jim Crow. I hate to say it. And mm. um, they still can't accept the fact that Barack Obama was the president for eight years. They still can't accept the fact that Kamala Harris is the vice president. And the guy she's the, who was her president was the vice president to Barack Obama. I mean, they, they yeah. still can't take the defeats that mm. a... Brown America is going to hand the Republican Party. Yeah, repeatedly in the future. Now, right. it seems like Hate Machine, somebody should be producing that right now. Well, it's been published by Play Scripts. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of my plays are plays that America's afraid to see. <laughs> <laughs> you know, much less produce. Um, because they deal with the truth. You yeah. know, and sometimes America doesn't want to hear the truth, you know, but I've been all, all through my life as a playwright, I've been speaking truth to power. And I wrote a short play in response to the George Floyd uh, death called Speaking Truth to Power. And I wrote a companion piece to that called The Content of Our Character, uh, inspired by, you know, the line from Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, uh, asking us to be judged by the content of our character, you know, and not by the color of our skin. And, um, so, you know, I'm always paying homage to Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, Huey Newton, different people that led us, um, that were brave enough to lead us, that had the vision to lead us, that and that were silenced either through cocaine addiction, which is how they got Huey, or with a gun. You know, they got they assassinated Mark and Martin and Malcolm, you know. They assassinated Mega Evers. You know, they, you know, so many people that could have been my heroes or were my heroes were cut down. Mm -hmm. And even John F. Kennedy, who, you know, was kind of a liberal white president, more or less, but, you know, it's really not, you know, a lot of pressure was put on him to, you know, deal with the, the race issue. And, you know, Johnson kind of, you know, had to come in and follow his, in his footsteps after he got assassinated. But, you know, Robert Kennedy could have been a hero. He got cut down. You know, so the assassinations, 
America was founded on bloodshed. They took this land from Native Americans, from who we call Indians, who they, they named the football team after in Washington, the Redskins. Um, mm-hmm. This country was taken by violence, with violence. You know, we fought a revolutionary war against the British to, you know, be an independent nation. But this nation was founded on split slavery. It was slave labor allowed this country to flourish. Mm-hmm. And, that and you know, theft. Reparations. That America can't afford the reparations they really owe. No. We will bankrupt this nation <laughs> if, yeah. if they truly paid the reparations that black people were owed. No, and look how they did, you know, look that. how they did Asian Americans. Look how they did the Japanese during World War II. I mean, this is a racist country. And yeah. white supremacy has been put on notice. Well, the colonialist mindset, which is always about how, I mean, colonies, I was arguing with somebody the other day, and they're like talking about a colon. They didn't understand what a colonialist mindset was. They made a mistake with that. And I was like, no, colonialism is about making money and destroying cultures. You know, that's all it is. And so if you have a country that is like the United States, very much founded by colonialists, that's the only mindset they have. How can they squeeze the most money out and how can they destroy whatever was there before them to pretend like there was nothing there before them? And so those two things, when we have a country that no longer has a frontier, it no longer has space to grow, so it's eating itself. The colonialist mindset is still eating its own citizens now, and it's destroying its own kind of whatever America kind of culture. America eats its young. <laughs> yeah, George really. Clinton said America eats its young. Mm-hmm. America yeah. does eat its young, and it kills its young. I mean, look at yeah. this boy that got this um, right, uh, Dante Wright, that was killed mm-hmm. while the George Floyd trial was going on. Yeah. I mean, you know, over an inspired license tag, yeah. over having something hanging from his mirror, some air freshener hanging from his mirror, and she was on duty training another cop mm-hmm. with CCL, taser, taser, but it pulled yeah. out a revolver and shot him. Yeah. A taser yeah. is on the other side of your hand. Right. <laughs> other hand. We can. And your revolver is supposed to be in your dominant hand. Didn't yeah. she know? And she was training somebody. Right. She was going to train them how to harass black people. How to kill numbers. people. Yeah. And she just went for what she normally goes for and was like, yeah, her her reflex was violence towards this black man who had done nothing to deserve the violence. Then that that was that's the zero. The given is violence against blacks. And then anything that's not that. Oh, you hear about that? The case of the woman in I think it was Buffalo, black woman who is a police officer who like 15 years ago, she pulled a fellow officer a white guy off of somebody who he was choking to death and she pulled him off and then she got fired and she's been suing the department ever since that she finally won her case and got all of her back pay and all of that stuff. And she's trying to, to make it, uh, she's working towards getting a law passed where uh, police officers are kind of required to stop a fellow officer. If that officer is breaking the law and brutalizing someone and the cop that she pulled off, uh, he got a, a promotion. When she got fired, he got a promotion, but now he's in prison because he ended up brutalizing somebody else. Wow. So Yeah, we're going to see so, what happened to the other uh, four cops or three cops that were with Derek Chauvin. So, you know, yeah. they're, they're being tried together. I, and I'm, it's going to be interesting to see what they plead now that he's already been found guilty. You know, if they're yeah. going to take a deal or something. You know. I mean, we'll see because that yeah. case, what, I've, what I always argue is that there's, they always say, you know, there's good cops and bad cops. I'm like, no, 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 no. There's psycho cops. Then there's, and it's a small group of psycho cops. Then there's good cops. And there's a small group of good cops. And then there's the vast majority who are bad cops because they're the ones that will stand by and watch a fellow cop commit a crime and not do anything. That makes them a bad cop. Every right. time they fill out a form and lie on it or anything like that, they're bad cops. Right. And what Collusion. we got to deal with this. Oh, yeah. Because right. they originally going to say that George Floyd died at the hospital. That's what they wrote yeah. in their original report. Right. That he That's had a, a crime. a medical issue and he died at the hospital. And thank you for the videotape. Thank you for yep. cell phones. 
Thank you for smartphones. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that want, brave young girl. Yeah, that really. Was brave enough, you know, while, and, 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 while uh, Shoban was looking at her to continue filming him. To have that heart to just keep doing it. Yeah, and you see him make eye contact, yeah. the threat that he implies and that she keeps right. going. One thing I also wanted to ask you about, like going from being in Oakland, writing plays about, you know, activism, because there's this big gap, you know, people may not know, you know, you were at state and then you were write, playwriting, playwriting, playwriting. So there's a big like 15 year gap before you go to gap. Iowa, 20 yeah. year gap before you go to Iowa. So you're writing all of these shows and you go to one of the whitest places in the United States. Because my play was uh, Servant of the People that just premiered in uh, St. Louis and uh, Atlanta, and there was a lot of stuff out there on uh, on the internet about, who is this Robert Alexander? <laughs> um, mm. But one of the funny things about Servant of the People is that it, it let me be uh, on stage with Bobby Seale in Atlanta. Uh, wow. Jemani Productions that produced the play did a, uh, mm -hmm. a program called A Community Without Walls, and they had me mm. and Bobby Seale talk back in the talk back in a symposium after one performance of a, a matinee performance of Servant of the People. And at the end of the performance, Bobby Seale gave me a hug in front of 500 people. And wow. uh, Tupac's mother, Afeni Shakur, was in the audience. Mm -hmm. She was sitting next to Kathleen Cleaver, who was then a professor wow. at Emory College uh, in the law school. So, uh, and she called it a, tra she called Servant of the People a travesty in the Atlanta Journal Constitution. But, you know, really? they were lined up around the block to see that travesty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's hard it's when you're writing, fun. you know, writing political plays and trying to, you are going to piss off, uh, you know, even the people that you want to, you know, that you're trying to support sometimes because it's always going to, there's going to be some subjectivity to it. The experience yeah. that they had in the revolution is just a little bit different and you may not be telling it the way they want to. And it's like, we need more plays. Right. You know? And more, point, more point of views. We can yeah. have all, you know, um, thank God another people came out with party people by Universes, Stephen mm -hmm. Sapp and Mildred Ruiz. Um, they read Servant of the People when, um, because they were thinking about doing it at the uh, New York uh, Playwrights Workshop. And, um, mm -hmm. but they read about it, you know, they knew about it. And they said, you need to be doing Robert Alexander's plays here. And um, but then they ended up writing their own Panther play, which uh, premiered at Oregon Shakespeare Festival, uh, for which I hear uh, now Mildred and uh, Stephen Sapp actually live in uh, Ashland now because they're raising a, a son, because they thought you know raising a son in Oregon versus raising a son in New York was you know it would be easier. Well, I don't know. You don't think it's so, tough huh? because. <laughs> Well, well, you know the org. Uh, Kim the is Ashland living police. in Ashland. Kim Yule lives in Ashland now. Oh, really? Because yeah. the Medford Police, I think, it's Medford Police, were, are just in the news because they there was a um, Asian American actor who was uh, an actor at the festival, and he got uh, beaten up by the cops. I mean, oh, he really? was he was like drunk and making his way home, and they should have just helped him go home, but instead they kind of beat him up and took him into and arrested him, and. And uh, kind of brutalized him at the play at uh, uh, at the police station, and so he complained about it, and then they gave him a hard time, and so then he sued them, and that case I think just got settled like in the last week or something. And this and is so in it's in the news. It was in Ashland. Yeah, he wow. was one of the actors, and wow. they were saying this isn't a safe place to be. That that I mean, it was in Medford, which is the big town right next to Ashland. Okay. The big town. Uh, <laughs> It's got two streets um, that uh, and and so people are like, you know, we, it's easy for us, you know, and that's why I was asking about Iowa, you know, to be in a situation where you where you're actually on this little island, you know, and and you look around and you can see other people and people are talking to you stuff. But just outside of that space, it's different. And that's the thing, you know, in and I know that in Ashland, it's like you just go to Medford and it's it's like you're. You know, in another like now it would be called the Trump land, you know, right. as opposed to Ashland, Man. which is like it was like, oh, it's so liberal there. Right. Yeah. Iowa City was like that. It was very liberal. It was like Berkeley, um, mm. little college town. Um, Naomi Wallace was living there when I was there, mm. the playwright. Mm -hmm. um, Rebecca Gilman went there. Um, 
Wow. Sherry Kramer, um, Lee uh, Brewer, there were a lot of interesting people. Lee Blessing, who's hmm. a graduate wow. of uh, Iowa's Playwrights Workshop. It was, you know, um, it was kind of interesting being there. I mean, it was just, I needed a little break from Oakland. I needed a little break from, you know, thinking former Panthers were out to get me. You know, I just, <laughs> I just needed a little place to lay low for a couple of years, which is what I did. And then after I uh, graduated from the program, I, I took I did a residency at Woolly Mammoth Theater in Washington D.C. Right. So my parents got to see some more of my work, and um, and it was interesting to be back home while they, you know, when they're late, you know, my my mother was 84 when she passed away, and my dad was 88 when he passed away, and uh, it was it was very interesting to see them. It was sad, really, to see them in their declining health. You know, mm-hmm. being, you know, you like once a child, you like, what's that term? Twice a child, once a, once a man, twice a baby. Mm-hmm. And, you know, mm-hmm. you know, they both had diapers and, you know, and all that. And, you know, so it was just, you know, and that made me think about what am I going to be like when I'm in my 70s and 80s, you know, and um, yeah. I talked to Joan, you know, she's, you know, she's like 80 and she says she feels 80. Mm. And, um. You know, but you got to live, you know, you got to live on. You don't have much of a choice. I hope to continue to keep writing. Yeah. And keep fighting. Yeah. Because it's no reason writing is fighting. Yeah. That's the line I got from Ishmael. He said, writing is fighting. So Mm. that's all we got to do. You got to keep writing and keep fighting. Carlisle Brown is living in Minnesota. He lives in Minneapolis. Uh, He's a great playwright. So he's there, you know. I hope he's writing about the George Floyd, yeah. Eric Showman situation because he got plenty of material right there in his lap. And Man, that store, yeah. Cup Foods, they had a history of calling uh, the police on bl- citizens of the black community. Really? Yeah, they're Pakistani owned, but they got a lot of black employees. And it was a black boy that called the police that mm-hmm. told his employer, his boss, about the fake twenty dollar bill. And mm. he was on the stand. He said, you know, he, I just wish I had kept the bill and had them dock it for my paycheck if I knew all of this was going to happen to George Floyd. So that boy who who called the police on George Floyd, he was living in the apartment above Coo- Cup Foods with his mother. Mm-hmm. And he, since that incident happened, he quit his job and him and his mother moved out of that apartment. Mm. Just, just couldn't take it there anymore. Yeah. 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 It's tough. It's like you think that it's just a whatever that situation is, whether it's the cops pulling you over or somebody who's like that is just going, I was just doing something that I didn't know it was gonna turn into murder. Yeah. You know. Um, it's it's heartbreaking, but it also, you know, underlines the how how thin <laughs> the line for black Americans between life and death can be. You know, that it's and, something and black so life trivial. Is cheap. Black yeah. life is twenty dollars. Yeah. Black life is less than twenty dollars. Less than twenty dollars. Wasn't even a real twenty dollars. <laughs> right. Was yeah. Black life is cheaper and cheaper. You know. So, so it's it's sad. It's sad. Well, that's why that's why it's good to have you know people out there telling stories like you're doing. Are you working on anything now? Um, just trying to get through the school year right now. <laughs> <laughs> and plan my next move. Uh, as yeah. an artist, but uh, you know, just you know, yeah, I'm you know, fortunate. I'm living with uh, my son in his five bedroom house, and um, with his blended family, and mm-hmm. you know, so I'm grandpa to seven kids. So, wow, I don't, I don't know if that's ever gonna happen with me. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good, you know, when you have that chance, when you have that, you know, that that. I was talking to somebody about winning the lottery recently, you know, and I, I've known I've known people who have just blown their lives up. I knew a guy who easily spent, uh, I'd say, twenty thousand dollars a year on the lottery, and by the time he passed away, he left his family nothing except wow. for debt, and wow. uh, he should he could have easily left them a lot of money, and instead, right. because he didn't appreciate. That as a black man, he had survived so much. He had succeeded. He had been. He was from a little town in 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 Alabama, you know. Or no, a little town in Georgia. Little town, 
and that he had gotten all the way up to all this stuff, but he could never feel like he had enough. He never felt, he always felt the pressure of, of what is success in the United States. And he thought he had to be a star as opposed to, man, you lived to die of kind of old age with a house and a family. That is such a win. That is such a lottery win for a black man because yeah. it is, the odds are so much against you. Um, so for people to be able to get to a point where they're like, you know, like you, you've got all of these plays that have been produced and published and your name is known and your, and your work has impacted and changed people's lives is such a, uh, like I said, it's a, it's a, it's a whole lot of work and it's, everything is building on the previous thing. It's not luck, but it is that, that, <laughs> To be able to have the situation you have, you know, you're there, you get to play granddad, that you get to kind of rest a little before you write right. your next play. Right. <laughs> it's, right. But you know, it's interesting. When I was at Woolly Mammoth Theater in D.C., I met Chadwick Boseman uh, when he was a mm. student at Howard. And um, he was the assistant director on my play, The Last Orbit of Billy Myers. And then he was the lead actor in a play I wrote called Willie Bop, Willie Drop. And... Um, Chadwick, I knew then that he was going to be major, but I didn't know that his life was going to be so short. And that's the thing, the sad thing about black people and our health. We, you know, black people, we got the most diabetes. We have the most, you know, heart disease. We have, you know, we have all these issues. And um, we have communities that are infiltrated with drugs, which are a big temptation. You know, when you think you could have to buy the only high America has to offer. And then, you you know, you're on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine one year, and then you're dead the next. So yeah. it's kind of sad. You know, well, I think it's kind of sad. The, one of the things that came out when, when the um, opioid crisis hit white America, right? the idea of deaths by despair suddenly became a thing. People being, feeling so oppressed that, and that oppression, suddenly when it was white people, it was a medical issue, that uh, was killing people. And all these poor white working class folks in, in Kentucky and in Appalachia who were dying younger and younger and younger uh, from, you know, from drug addiction and from smoking and just from the stress of living their lives. And I want to go, that's awful. Uh, black people have been dealing with this, the deaths of despair, whether it's self-destruction or just the tension. You know, of of walking outside and hoping you don't get killed. You know right. that that shortens your life just from the worry, and and so uh, again, yeah, you can never syndrome. tell. Yeah, really, it is syndrome for being black. <laughs> yeah, it's black traumatic syndrome. Right. So, BTST. So, well, anyway, thank you very much. I want to I want to let you go because I know okay. you got stuff to do. And it was really nice talking to you. I'm glad we this, this worked out. And um, I, I think we got everything. Okay. You know, man. sometimes I I interview people and they and they they forget stuff and they're like, oh yeah, right. And I think that I think that we we talked through a lot of stuff. And uh, hope to see you soon. All right, Michael. And, all right. Say Thanks a lot, Robert. Say hello to Belina for me. I will. Bye bye. Bye bye.